Welcome uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Peter Kirby, and uh, with me is Eric Matheson to help give the introductions. And uh, I'd just like to welcome you tonight. Uh, it's a great turnout. And I want you to know that uh, the event is being uh, recorded and it will be available as a YouTube video. So I will be posting that to the people who uh, are on my list. And at any event, you'll be able to get it sometime this week by YouTube. Uh, pass it on to your friends. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands of the Ojibwe of Treaty 3. I'd like to thank the museum staff, in particular Marcus and Marcus and Bray and and uh, Lynn uh, and Lori for allowing us to use their space tonight, which is a, a great venue. Um, coffee, tea, and cookies are available. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. Don't wait until the end. We hope to make this an annual event. Uh, of course, there'll be different topics. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Eric, who's going to do the real introduction. I feel like I should be so quite at home here. <laughs> it was uh, wonderful to have you come out here this evening. Um, it is indeed my, my privilege to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Scott Higgins and Dr. Mike Patterson to you. I've always thought it's, it's, it's an amazing gift to be able to spend your, your life and earn a living doing the thing that you're most passionate about. It's a double gift if you get to do it in a place that you love. Um, when I was communicating with, with Scott and Mike this, this week, Mike made the comment that he's traveled extensively all over the world. Uh, but he still finds Northwestern Ontario the most beautiful place on the planet. So, a real, real tough job to have employment. I'm always curious too as to uh, how people end up in these lifetime careers. You have, when you came here on the seat of the chairs, uh, their, uh, both Scott and Mike's professional bio. Uh, so, I'm just going to deviate from that a little bit and talk about their more personal side um, and share with you some of what, what they share with me. But when I asked them what, um, what that winding path looked like, uh, Mike mentioned first of all that as a boy he loved dinosaurs. And I thought that sounds very familiar. And then, and then from that it expanded into a love of of nature as a whole. Um, and then as he became, got to that point where he was considering a career, he knew that he wanted something that took him outside, but that also challenged his mind. As you have noted from the, from the bio, uh, Mike has been at the experimental laser, which it was then known as, uh, starting in 1992. He was chief scientist, chief research scientist there for, for 10 years and now continues to uh, work there uh, in the area of research. He and his wife Gail have two boys in their mid to late 20s. And obviously, um, my experience in uh, moving and hiking, um, mountain biking, both cross country and downhill skiing has been passed on to his family. 
when I asked Scott the same same question, uh, Scott talked about an aha moment that uh, when he was a uh, summer student there in the mid '90s, that statement kind of took me back. So I had to do a little bit of uh, calculating in my mind, and I thought, okay, he was a summer student at ELA in the mid '90s. I was a summer student there in the early '70s. That means that when I was there, Scott was about two. I was wrong. He hadn't been born yet. <laughs> so I have every once in a while I have those moments where I, I feel my age more than I want to. The summer that Scott was there, the Experimental Lakes area was working on a, a project making a, a reservoir to mimic the river reservoirs created by the hydroelectric dams. And Scott was one of a number of people who monitored the, number, the greenhouse emissions and the mercury contamination from that reservoir. But his comment after that summer was that it was the greatest summer of his life. And he was hooked as a fisheries research scientist. Scott's family is on the other end of the spectrum from Mike and Gales. He has a, a daughter that is three, son that's three, son that's three, a daughter that will be five uh, coming in the summer. His wife is uh, head of the chemistry department there, so staying out at the IISD ELA is, a, is really a family affair. And as he said, they, they raise their kids in the bush. Um, this past summer, the, the chief uh, Ted Gurdon for their kids was to just be, sits quietly in the boat. This, this coming year, he's hoping to teach them some fishing. When I thought about what motivated these two men to continue this work, what I received was the words, working with a wonderful group of people, doing something that we hope will make a difference and working in the outdoors. When I started, I said there were two gifts. One to be doing the thing that you're most passionate about, doing it in a place that you love. The third gift is ours tonight. The gift is ours receiving from them their work, their knowledge, their experience as we pass the crystal ball to them and say, what's it going to look like in the year 2050? Friends, would you please welcome Scott Higgins and Mike Myers. Uh, can you hear me without the microphone? Should I, I use the microphone or are you okay? You can hear me. So, yeah. okay. Hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Mike, by the way. <laughs> Not sure who's who. Uh, I, I uh, really want to thank Peter and Eric for inviting me here tonight and for all of you for coming up to see. I, I, uh, I've worked at the, uh, the Experimental Lake Series since 1992. Uh, I guess it's my 28th summer. The math is right. We've been close to Kenora, and I feel a really deep connection to Kenora driving home. Get a chance to, to come here and talk to you. Uh, so to have this opportunity is incredible. And I also, uh, we, we both Scott and I, all of us at the Experimental Lakes area, owe oh, a great thanks to Kenora. I think many of you know we went through a near death experience a few years ago, and it was only because of the support of people in Kenora, uh, led by Peter and Eric and, and others, and sure the audience, that, that we're here today. So I. I uh, really thank all of you for for your support for ELA and the experimental lakes here. So uh, Eric mentioned uh, that we were here to talk about uh, 2050 and what our lakes and streams and climate may look like, and, and we agreed to this uh, several probably months or two, a couple months ago. And, and it was only when Scott and I sat down in the last week to. Uh, or two to figure out exactly what we're going to say that the magnitude of that title struck home. <laughs> and, and there is no way that we can even begin to scratch the surface uh, of this. 
Uh, you could probably fill, you could certainly fill a course at a university or probably an entire degree program trying to address that question. Uh, so we decided we're going to focus on the work that we're doing in the Experimental Lakes area and what it can tell us uh, about how our lakes might look in another uh, 30 years or so and, and how our research hopefully uh, help us to, to better understand what that trajectory might be, and maybe uh, to try to reduce or eliminate or minimize uh, some, some potential outcomes that we don't want to see. Um, so uh, I'm going to start uh, by talking uh, about what we do at ELA, uh, sort of at a broader scale, and, and then Scott's going to talk about climate change specifically, which is he's really our climate change expert in the group at the experimental lakes area. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I, before I talk about ELA, I just want to take a, a step back even further and just talk for a moment about water. Uh, and, and I'm sure if any of you think of thought much about water, you, you recognize that every part of your lives is connected to it. Everything we do, we need water to drink, we need water for our food, whether that's for cattle, for crops, for fish. Uh, we need water for sanitation, we need water for our industrial processes, all of our power is generated mostly by at least boiling water or running water by turbines. Uh, and we use water for recreation and Certainly for anybody that lives in this part of the world, water is deeply connected to who we are as human beings, I think. I, I, uh, despite this really obvious importance of water, I, I don't think as a society we do a particularly good job at managing and we need to, to do it better. Uh, part of the, the reasons, I think, why we, we have so much difficulty and why we struggle with managing water especially fresh water, uh, is because it is so deeply connected to everything that we do. So I, I, I just started by saying uh, every, the, everything we do is affected by water, the reverse of that is everything we do affects our water and our water quality. When we burn fuels or, or smelt or put things into the atmosphere, I, those chemicals and the light can be taken up in, in rain. That rain can be transported in the, the gases that, that, that help put these things in the rain. It can be transported around the world. I, I do a lot of work personally on mercury. Uh, my favorite mercury that contaminates fish in this area comes from China. So activities of people that live on the other side of the planet are affecting our water quality and the quality of our fish here in, in northwestern Ontario. The rain falls on the land, around lakes and rivers, uh, where it moves across the land as it's collected in the low parts of the landscape. And, and as it moves across the land and through the soils, it picks up things and signatures of whatever it is we're doing on that landscape. So anything that we do in the watersheds that surround lakes and rivers potentially affects the water quality that, that, that we're using. And in turn, uh, as the water moves down rivers and streams to the ocean, uh, it may pick up things that we put directly into the water. So the water that we use here is being affected by people far, far away from us upstream, or even in the case of atmospheric mountains uh, on the other side of the planet. And the activities that we are undertaking here are affecting the water from people that live downstream and far away from us. And, and because of this, it's, it's a, a complete integrator of our global activities. And, and this is also because there are so many different uses of land, and so many people using it in different ways, is why it, it is really difficult to manage water effectively. And, and in part, this is a, a problem, as we call it, of multiple stressors. Uh, if we're talking about what are the lakes going to look like in another 30 years, uh, we have to consider more than just climate change, although that's a big issue. We also have to think about the ways that uh, we are using the planet and specifically how we are uh, using the water and the landscape around these lakes locally and uh, nationally and of course even internationally. 
And now we have to think about how changes in uh, the way we as human beings are using our planet uh, interact with each other to affect water quantity and water quality. And, and today, uh, I think uh, uh, we're not really talking much about water, water quantity, although this is a very big issue. Uh, as primarily, it's an issue in many parts of the world, less so in Canada, because we're a very water-rich country. At the same time, that means we have, I think, a special obligation to look after our water, because we do have so much of the world's fresh water. Um, but anyway, when it comes to water quality, we still have to consider all these different things. So, uh, some of the things that are really important for affecting water quality will be land use, and here I'm thinking about things like forestry, agriculture, mining, uh, invasive species, uh, overfishing potentially, hydrologic interactions, and by that I mean things like construction of dams, reservoirs, uh, toxic chemicals, uh, and, and nutrient loading, which affects all of those. And uh, it's interesting because I, I have been uh, on, a, on the edge of interested in what happen, is happening in Lake of the Woods, which is right outside the door here. And, and if you read the late, most recent State of the Lake report, Todd Sellers is here, he's one of the authors of that. Uh, all of the, many of these things speak to Lake of the Woods and our issues here. Primarily, there, there's concerns over nutrient loading, invasive species, uh, certainly hydrologic alterations, and, and how they interact and how they affect. The, the lake, and, and will continue to affect the lake going on in the future. So, this brings us to the work that we do at the Experimental Lakes area, uh, which is located here and here. And it is, uh, many of you will have heard this before, and I apologize if you have, but I just want to explain who we are and what we do at ELA. Uh, we're a whole ecosystem research program that started in 1968, and it's based around a facility that's about a one and a half hour drive from here. Uh, I'll show you a map in a second. And, and for the first 46 years of our existence, we were operated by the federal government. And in 2014, we were transferred to the International Institute for Sustainable Development, so that now we are known as the IISD, Experimental Lakes Area, instead of just the Experimental Lakes Area. And we're now a charitable, not-for-profit organization. And our primary sources of funding come from uh, the province of Ontario and the federal government again. And uh, I have to take this moment uh, to let you know that if you're interested in supporting the work that we do, we definitely rely on donations. We have some materials up here if you're interested in. Uh, we would love it if you uh, were interested in, in helping us out. Um, this is my new place in the world. So the primary goals of the research that we do there are, and our organization is to better understand national and international threats to the environment. And we've been primarily focused on fresh water, although we are trying, now that we're with ISD, to expand out into the watershed and onto the, the land as well. But, but we are uh, a group that's primarily built around fresh water. And, and our ultimate goal is to try and find solutions for environmental problems. And I, I don't have a lot of time to go through our history, and I'm not going to tonight, but I think we have the, uh, historically, some really important contributions that have helped to resolve or deal with uh, some important environmental issues like acid rain or uh, algal blooms, uh, mercury, and so forth. And, and now that we're with ISD, uh, we're also, more so than in the past even, trying to provide a platform for science education and for communication and for outreach. Here we are. <laughs> this is something that we didn't do and couldn't do as much as a part of the federal government. Um, I think I said in one of my emails to Eric that I feel like Scott and I are in the information meeting. We're trying to do research to develop new knowledge for people to use, and if people don't can ever know it or hear it or see it, its value isn't that great. Uh, so it's really important we communicate this, and, and there are a group at IASD that are, are really good at this. And they're, uh, I'm learning lots from them. This is probably is not a good. You probably can't see any of this, but the, the main point I wanted to make is that if you go to our website, and I encourage you to go. You will find all kinds of articles on different topics related to our research and research around the world. Uh, there's old blogs and newsletters and all this stuff. If you, if you, uh, contact uh, us and. and uh, I really urge you to go and try and look at this because I think there's a lot of really valuable and interesting information there. And, and furthermore, uh, if you're interested in coming out to the PLA, 
Uh, we are now running tours in open houses, uh, and uh, we hired in the summer now a, a full-time student who shows people around the camp. Uh, and, and again, if you're interested in kind of coming to ELA, uh, check our website. And Scott, you said you have you brought some materials too, right? So we're going to talk to us after. Uh, uh, we're definitely interested in having people come out and see what we're doing and see what's at the facility. And I can tell you, after talking to many, many people, uh, that there is nothing like visiting the field. I, I, I can show you some nice pictures and I can talk about it, but it, nothing captures it. Like, if you visit the facility and see what we do, I think you will really appreciate it. Anyway, so this is just a Google map shot of ELA. I don't know how well you can see it. Uh, I'm on, there's a little yellow line across the top. That's the Trans Canada Highway. Norris, somewhere out here. <laughs> Driving this that way. And we're down a 30 kilometer road in red, the Pine Road. Many of you probably know it uh, at, at the end. Of, and the, the one thing I really kind of like the truth, speaking here is something everybody here knows. Uh, but I do want to point out hundreds of little tiny lakes that are in this area. And, and it's these lakes that are the, the, the basis of the research that we do with the experimental lakes area. And, and um, there are 58 of these lakes that have been set aside by special legislation where we can undertake whole ecosystem experiments. And, and this is really unique to uh, ELA. There's really nowhere else in the world where you can do it with the ease and the regularity of has been done at ELA. And we have done over 50 whole ecosystem experiments on a whole lot of different topics. And I, I'm not even going to begin to show all these to you. I'll just show you a couple of quick ones so you understand what it is we do. Uh, but, and, and the reason these are, are important is that they, they, they are helping us to understand where our lakes will be in 30 years, how these lakes will change, and how our activities as human beings are changing lakes, affecting lakes, and hopefully, uh, if things look like they're going in a direction that we as a society would not want them to go, provide advice on how uh, to, to make sure they don't get to a place in 30 years that we don't want them to be. Well, and the other thing I guess it's important to point out is there's very little other human activity around these lakes here. So it's a little bit of logging, some deep fishing maybe, but uh, the, these lakes are very pristine. These are some of the most pristine lakes anywhere that are close to a major population center. So, it, it, and that's something that, uh, again, everybody here I know is aware of. These lakes are part of the largest ecosystem in the Boreal region. And, and it, it's really important uh, from a whole lot of perspectives. It plays a key role in things like climate, uh, carbon storage, and Scott probably talked a bit about this. And, your part of the talk, it, it covers a very large fraction of Canada, something over 50% of Canada is in the Boreal region. So it's crucial to, to us as people and our economy and so forth. And it also has a disproportionate fraction of the world's lakes and, and rivers, uh, lakes especially. There's a lot of fresh water in, in this region. So, for some reason, the black backgrounds have become a white uh, on the screen, and that there's the little sign up there says whole ecosystem approach. But anyway, what we specialize in at ELA is whole ecosystem science. So we try to deal with these little lakes in their entirety and, and, and as, as humans. Uh, and, and that includes measurements, regular measurements of things like climate and weather. We have an Environment Canada meteorological station up on site, hydrology, water flows. You can't really understand lakes or rivers. This may seem like stating the obvious, but you can't understand them if you don't understand how the water moves and through them and into them. We regularly sample a series of lakes for all the major components of water chemistry and all the key parts of the food lake. So Scott is a specialist in plants, primary producers. I'm a specialist in bugs. Uh, and, and there's a, a group of us that work on fish. Uh, and, and uh, we try to cover the food web in its, uh, as, a, as a whole. And, and as I said a moment ago, ELA is really unique. There is nowhere quite like it. And people here should be really proud of ELA. Is it, uh, it, it is, I, I know it's a shallow pool when it comes to water quality and uh, lake science, but it, it, is, it is internationally known, globally recognized for the work that we do. And it, it, a lot of it is because of this unique capability to do whole ecosystem experiments. And the other thing that has become really important 
at ELA is that we have one of the largest, most comprehensive data sets on freshwater lakes anywhere in the world. ELA was never created as a monitoring site initially, but because we've been around so long, 50 years now, uh, we, we have amassed this, this really unique data set. And it has become really important for assessing the effects of things like climate change, which Scott's going to talk about. Um, and so these things really separated from most other places. I'm going to very quickly show you two whole ecosystem experiments that we did at ELA, just so you know what they what we're talking about. So maybe you don't. Uh, ELA was originally created in 1968 to address problems around excessive algal blooms. Uh, essentially, this is when lakes go green. And, and these algal blooms are comprised of microscopic plants and called algae or phytoplankton. And, and they, they are just like the grass on your lawn, your flowers in your garden, any, any plants anywhere that need nutrients to grow. And, and it's, well, it's been known for at least 150 years that many human activities uh, cause or, or result in us adding nutrients to waterways that can promote the growth of these plants, and sometimes to levels that are undesirable. Think of this, sewage treatment plants, agriculture, all of the forestry, in certain situations, all of these things can contribute nutrients to lakes and rivers and uh, promote these blooms. And these blooms are undesirable because uh, when they, the algae die, they decompose, they can use oxygen up in the water, they can lead to fish kills. Many of the species of algae that predominate in these blooms, can be, or some of them, can be toxic. And, and generally, people find them unpleasant. They, they look bad, they smell bad. The prices of cottages are directly tied to how green the water is in many parts of the world. So uh, this is not, uh, a very green lake is not typically a desirable state for a lake to be in. And this is a picture of like the woods, you can see these green algal blooms, it's a satellite photo. That's a picture of like Winnipeg, Grand Beach, uh, in 2006 with these algae washing up. <coughs> and, and this is, I still think the problem of eutrophication is the number one water quality issue in the world. Uh, it, it has led to the closure of drinking water in cities like Toledo. Uh, it affects millions of things. Well, and, well, all of you know Lake Woods, but it affects lakes. Everybody has been around and seen. And, and at the time ELA was created, the big question was which nutrients were most important for stimulating these algorithms. And the focus was on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And, and uh, you need to know this information in order to develop effective uh, water treatment or, and wine management practices and things like that, where to focus your attention. And so at the time, back in more like Eric's time, because before I was there, it was gone. Uh, the, the scientists at ELA added nutrients to lakes in different amounts and combinations. Uh, to see which ones promoted these algorithms. And, and, and you can see that the most famous, these are two of the most famous uh, studies. The lakes at ELA just have numbers, they don't have names, mostly. Uh, the one here far right uh, and the upper left there are pictures of Lake 2 to 6, which is a double basin lake divided in half. Uh, and, and carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus are added to one side and carbon and nitrogen to the other. And the side that got phosphorus turned bright green, the side that uh, didn't receive phosphorus remain clear. This is another lake, Lake 2 to 7 at LA, uh, where we, over the over 50 years now, it's the longest running experiment at LA. We've had different combinations of, of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus to it. Since 1992, we've only added phosphorus, and it's, you can see how green it is compared to Lake 305 in the background, which is a typical uh, reference or unimpacted lake at LA. Uh, and, and these studies show unequivocally the importance of phosphorus for promoting these blooms. And now if you walk in the safe way, you'll see phosphate, no phosphate detergents. Uh, you'll see signs around lakes that say don't use phosphorus. A lot of that is because of studies like this. And, and the really important point is that the results that we got at ELA, or the scientists at ELA, have got, got in this study, and, and what we have got in many, many other studies in ELA were quite different than the results you get from small scale studies in bottles and bags, things like that. And, and the, the, the really key thing is that experiments need to be done 
at the appropriate scale, the ecosystem scale, the scale at which we interact with the environment primarily. Uh, and, and the predictions made from small scales like labs and things like that often do a poor job of predicting what happens in nature. Okay? And so I'm not denigrating the small scale studies because they are really important, but ultimately this ability to test ideas here and ultimately to test remediation approaches is really important and we need to scale it. And I'll very quickly show one other example. This is uh, actually here. Yeah, I mentioned this with respect to Scott. These are some flooding studies we did. The reason I'm showing this is because uh, hydrologic <coughs> alterations to things like the Rainy River system and, and to Lake of the Woods itself are potentially important for Lake of the Woods. Uh, you don't see the kind of flooding as the Southern Indian Lake. Uh, you don't see that, that kind of flooding around here. But, uh, Changes in water flows from dams and reservoirs do have important effects on the, on the systems. Uh, and we undertook a study uh, at ELA that started in 1991, one year before I started there, where there was a small pond, you can see in the upper right, that we studied for a couple of years and then uh, flooded it by building this dam, a very small dam, very unlike the large scale dam that I know or something. And I uh, have used that, that study to better understand the effects of damming on mercury cycling, on greenhouse gas production, on uh, nutrients, and, and so forth. So it's just another example of the kind of cool ecosystem experiments we do. And, and as I mentioned, there's been over 50. And when you take all of these and all the different things that we've looked at, um, we are trying to build a, a picture of how human activities affect lakes and how we might deal with them. And the only, the, the last thing I wanted to address before I turn it over to Scott uh, is, you might have asked me why we need to do these kinds of studies as opposed to just going to lakes that are already affected by human activities and seeing, trying to understand from those. I, and I, I, I just want to emphasize that the reasons for this are, are at least twofold. Uh, first, I, we don't know how lakes are affected by human activities usually. We don't know what they look like prior to humans being there. So it, we, it's really hard to know whether what we're seeing is a consequence of, of human activities or where the lakes were always like that uh, for many things. The other thing is that once people generally get to the lakes, they start affecting them in multiple ways. And when I just talk about Lake of the Woods, they, you know, we, we, I mentioned the invasive species, nutrients, uh, hydrologic alterations, all of these things are happening simultaneously. And, and it becomes very difficult to disentangle the effects of these different things that we're doing uh, when they're all happening at the same time. So ideally, we can just manipulate one thing at a time in a very controlled fashion uh, and try to understand its impact uh, as, as separated from all the others. And, and ultimately, uh, this will help us to understand how, how these lakes are, are being influenced by what we're doing. And because of, especially because I'm here in Toronto, I, I just do want to emphasize uh, that there's a lot of oversight that goes into these studies. Uh, we, we're very, very cautious about what we can do with the lakes and how we put the lakes in the study on and how, how we affect them. Uh, there is a, a research advisory board that oversees all whole ecosystem experiments at ELA. Uh, and that board is comprised of representatives from uh, the Ministry of Environment, uh, Conservation, and uh, Parks. No, right. Sorry, it just changed its name. Uh, and, and the Ministry of Natural Resources, Forestry, and uh, I don't know if there's another. Anyway, uh, OMN, what used to be OMN are. <laughs> uh, and, and several like, external scientists that oversee all these experiments. We never do experiments that are a threat to the public uh, or to public health. And we never, uh, the other thing is important to realize about these lakes is when we manipulate them, we manipulate them to the kinds of conditions typically that are seen in thousands, maybe even millions in the case of eutrophication of lakes around the world. We try to manipulate them so they look like lakes that are have been affected. And we don't go to extreme levels. We want our, our results to be meaningful and within the range of what we see uh, in Canada and elsewhere. So we're doing to one of these small lakes what has been done already to thousands and thousands and thousands of lakes elsewhere. 
And, and all of the lakes are, must be by legislation restored to their natural state and provincial standards. Uh, and, and I can tell you that of the more than 50 studies that have been done at ELA, I was involved in, in looking at the data uh, when the transfer took place, and, and uh, they have recovered. They have all recovered. Uh, so I, I have a lot of confidence that, that this is something that we can do. Okay, so that's my introduction to ELA. I'm going to, now I'm going to turn things over to Scott to talk about climate change because, in many ways, climate change is the big elephant in the room and one that's really hard uh, to factor in to the, these manipulations because the, the ground is moving, the water is moving underneath us. Anyway, Scott. So I'm going to talk a, a bit today about uh, climate change in Royal Lakes, like we have here. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is when we talk about climate change and their impacts on lakes, is just to talk about how the climate's changed in this region. Uh, and then the second part is, is how lakes have responded, and then, of course, the ultimate question in Crystal Ball is, what are these systems going to look like in 50 or 100 years? And I think the best place to start, or at least a good place to start, is, is how has the climate been over the longer time period? And so what you're seeing here is a graph uh, emerging from the last ice age, essentially, and what air temperatures look like. And this is, uh, the zero line is the long-term average, and so this is deviations from the long-term average. You can see as, and the two lines of the west and east are, are different parts of the borders, so we're right in between here, and we're right in between the west and the east. So, but both lines are quite similar. And you can see as we emerged from the last ice age, uh, air temperatures rose and became quite stable, and they remained stable for thousands of years. <coughs> Until the, uh, the uh, recent uh, era since around the 1850s, which uh, folks have now started to refer to as the Anthropocene, which is a whole new geologic era that where humans have impacted on the global climate cycle. Uh, and so we're, we're in that pattern. And, and as Mike said, ELA started uh, in 1968, and we started collecting records in 1968. So we're in that part of that last part of the graph where air temperatures have started to, to increase. Uh, and we, we have a fair amount of data to, uh, to confirm that. Scott, so, uh, can I ask you a question about that graph? Sure. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stochasticity in the, like, from about 1900 on, yeah. is that just because we have measurements available? And then if you go back 4,000 years ago, we didn't have the measurements, so we don't see that amount of variation? I think that that's right. So the older data is taken from a number of different proxies, climate proxies, so tree cores, uh, sediment cores, and things like this, where, yeah, you wouldn't get the year year variability that you see now. Now, of course, we can put out thermometers, digital thermometers that record at very short scales, so we get a much better idea but, but that variability that we see in the latter, the latter part is real, and you'll see that again in the next slide. Uh, so, so this is the, the mean annual air temperature data from the meteorological site that we have at the ELA. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people about climate change, and they say, I agree with it, or I don't agree with it. Uh, we don't really take a, we don't come in with uh, advanced uh, thoughts on this. We just say, let's look at the data, let's look at it together. And, what the top, the top and the bottom graph are the same data, and and really what the bottom graph is is similar to the last one. It's the deviance from the long-term average. So any of the bars that are red are below the long-term average, and any of the bars that are green are above the long-term average. And visually, it's a lot easier to interpret than maybe the top graph. And it becomes it's very clear when you look at this graph that the temperature is increasing, that the mean annual air temperature. Uh, and it's increasing at a little less than half a degree per decade, which is much faster than the global average. But it is very normal for this latitude that we're at here. So if you look at other weather stations around this latitude, you'll find very, very similar rates of temperature. But if, if, you, if I stop telling you any information right there, I think it'd be a very complete picture. 
And what this graph is doing is, is splitting up that temperature change over the annual season. So what, what we've got is compared by month here, you know, number one is January and 12 is December, uh, the, the, the temperature difference from, from the last 10 years of our data set, when in 2005 to 2015 when I did this, compared to the first 10 years of the data set. And what it's showing you here if it, uh, is that almost all of that temperature change is, is occurring in the winter and in the shoulder seasons. There's very little temperature change, at least so far, that's occurred here during the summertime. Summers are a lot warmer than they used to be. Uh, it's really the shoulder seasons, May, June, and especially in the fall, where we're getting a lot warmer temperatures. And so that, of course, begs the question for lakes. Why should we care? Because these lakes are ice covered at this point. So why would air temperature changes in the winter and the shoulder seasons even matter for lakes? That's a very good question. Um, well, first off, I mean, uh, I'm sure many people here are ice fishermen, love the outdoors in the winter, and that's not a unique quality. All around the world, where where winter winters experienced, almost everywhere in the northern hemisphere, and many other places too, uh, winter has become ingrained in our culture and our socioeconomics. Many small communities, uh, I know in, in, in southern Ontario, for example, really depend on on uh, snowmobiling, ice fishing, and the, to, to support their winter economy. And if those are gone, that's going to be a real tough uh, exercise for those businesses to survive. That's a big part of their annual income. Uh, and then the look to uh, uh, pictures that are there, uh, particular to parts of Ontario here and in Manitoba, ice roads up to northern communities are just incredibly important for those communities to get their uh, goods in for the whole year, especially heavy goods. And as the winter period starts to shrink, the, the, the duration where the ice is thick enough for these ice roads is declining. And so there's this real urge to get the, the, all of this, uh, uh, all of their annual supplies through a shorter period of time, and they run into problems like that where they maybe push the limits a little too much. So in 25 or 50 years from now, how, how many days are they actually going to have to to uh, truck their goods up to these northern communities. It's, it's a real concern. And so this brings us into the, the length of the ice covered season, or the, or the opposite of ice free season, when the water's open. And what we're seeing here is the same kind of graphs. The top one is the number of ice free days per year, days without ice. And then the bottom is the same. It's really clear that summer is getting longer and the period of ice cover is getting shorter. And it's happening at about four, degree, four days per decade. So we've seen uh, about 20 days less of ice cover since, uh, since the 1970s. Uh, and that trend is, is fully expected to continue and, and even accelerate. And I'll talk a bit, a bit about that. Oh, I guess right here. <laughs> so what we can do is, uh, uh, the, when, the, when the ice comes out in the spring and when it forms the fall, is very strongly related to the air temperatures, and it's very predictable. And so you can couple uh, those relationships with climate forecasts, which is what I've done here, to project out into the future and try to estimate uh, what, what these lakes are going to look like uh, in, in 25 or 50 years, as we've done. And, and part of it depends on the size of the lake. So we've measured the ice on and ice off dates uh, for a lake, a 50 hectare lake that's right beside our, our field camp. Uh, since 1969. Uh, and so that's the first part of the data. You see it's, it's highly variable from year to year. Uh, but then you take the climate forecasts uh, and you see that we're projected to lose e even more at a bit faster rate over the next 25 to 50 years. So we're, you see we're, we're, not, we're still going to have a lot of ice, so don't worry for the ice fishing in the crowd. But if, you, if we were in southern Ontario right now, there are lakes that are going to transition from being ice covered in the winter to having no ice cover at all. And, there, and some of those lakes are really important fisheries. And in fact, most of the fishery occurs during the wintertime. Lake Simcoe, for example, is one of those lakes. Very important for the local economy. Uh, and, and, it, and it's projected that that lake may not have ice in 25 to 50 years. Uh, and then the question comes about, so what's going to happen during the summertime? Uh, are we going to see uh, warmer uh, water temperatures? 
And one of the really uh, neat things about working at ELA and having this larger data is that we also contribute to global studies. So this is a study that we contributed to that looked at uh, water temperatures around the lakes around the world. And any, any dot that you see in red is where lakes have warmed uh, since 1985, I believe. Uh, and there's only a few lakes in blue in, in Europe that have that have cooled. And so lakes around the world are warming during, during the summer period, uh, and that's expected to increase. We haven't seen a lot of warming of our lakes here so far, just a little bit, but that's expected to increase. And I want to give a look, maybe just a bit of a primer about uh, uh, stratification in lakes. And I think everyone who's been in a lake uh, knows this intuitively, but the surface water of the lake is the part that warms up. And the bottom layer of the lake stays at about 4 degrees Celsius all summer and all winter long. It never heats up. And because the top of the lake heats up and the bottom doesn't, it creates this layer of stratification. It's almost like a wall. You could be swimming, and you've probably done this, and dove down into the water, and it's like swimming through a wall. All of a sudden, it goes from 20 or 25 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius very, very quickly. Uh, and so that's what's called the thermal. And, and, uh, and most of the biodiversity that you find in lakes occurs in this upper warm part of the lake. But the cold part is really important for some species like lake trout and, and other cold water species uh, that are uh, cold water relics of the last ice age. And so there's a real concern under some circumstances, and we'll talk about it, that as climate change occurs, that the thermocline deepens and it reduces the amount of habitat that's uh, available for lake trout. And there's some lakes, I mean, we have lakes of all different shapes and sizes in this region, and uh, we're right on the southern border of lakes that support lake trout. And so we're, we think we're going to lose a lot of lake trout lakes in the next 50 to 100 years, the smaller ones. The larger lakes will still continue to support those fish, but the smaller lakes are, are a bit of trouble. So when we, we talk about water temperatures, and I showed you that last graph that's focused on summer water temperatures, what I've done here is, is plotted two lines, actually the dashed lines that is the water temperature uh, in, in 1970, the surface water temperature, and the, and the solid line is the water temperature uh, in 2010. Uh, and I apologize for using uh, Julian Day at the bottom of the morning day, that's the day of the year. But basically where the lines come together, that's the summer period. And what I really wanted to point out here, uh, and this goes back to what I was saying about uh, changes in air temperature, primarily in the winter and the shoulder seasons, is that the really big changes aren't occurring during the summertime. They're actually occurring in the spring and the fall. That's where water temperatures are really changing the most. And that's really important for a number of species like lake trout. Because lake trout uh, prefer water temperatures below about 32 degrees Celsius. And so at, when the lakes stratify uh, and the surface waters start to warm up, they have to go down deep into the lake. Uh, and they basically live throughout the summer there, making forays up to the shallow water occasionally to feed. But it's not optimal for them, and they pay a, a price for that in terms of growth. And what's happening now is the lakes are stratifying a lot earlier. Uh, and so what that means is the lake trout have to go down deeper and spend a lot longer during, for that summer period, that deep part of the lake. And, and uh, for people who work on lake trout, they call it the summer starvation period. So in essence, that summer starvation period is getting longer and longer. And that's going to, again, occur over the next 25 to 50 years. And so what we think, and the hypotheses have been, is that, so this is a period of low feeding, it's going to influence the growth rates of, of these fish. Um, so we love fishing, obviously, the fish up there. This is, this is not a lake trip, but a white, white uh, sucker. Um, and I wanted to start by talking about warm water fishing. It's not just cold water fish that are going to be affected. Is that uh, fish, unlike people, so we regulate our own body temperatures. Fish uh, take on the body temperature of the water itself. And as the water temperature increases uh, in the surface waters, essentially what that means is fish have to eat more food just to maintain their body weight, right? And it's, and it's by an exponential factor. So for every degree Celsius, the water temperature warms, fish need to eat several times more food, it's like three or four times more food, just to maintain their current growth rates. 
And so what we've seen um, is that for warm water fish in our lakes that aren't fish, so these lakes that aren't, are, 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 don't have any recreational fishing pressure on them, fish are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's where that graph is on the way. And that's at a whole number of different age classes. It's, it's not just the, it's the young of the year fish all the way to the adult fish are getting smaller and smaller. So it means they're not growing as fast. So this data that we're finding from the ELA is confirming what the hypotheses are of, of fisheries researchers around the globe. But they have a real challenge in coming to that conclusion because most lakes they study have these multiple stressors. They're fish, there may be other impacts on these lakes. And so if they show a graph like this, they say, well, maybe it's just fishing pressure that's making this fish fall. But we can rule that out because, because there's no fishing pressure at the other. Yes? I have a burning question. So she might curiosity for asking for it. Oh, sorry. But uh, do they use any Google positioning chips on, the, on any of the fish? And they do a graph to see where they are, and uh, then they're tied with a, a weight gain or weight loss? That is two slides. Okay. <laughs> uh, so for lake trout, which are an example of a cold water fish that requires cold water temperatures, there, there, there's, a, there's another sort of term of these, it's called the Goldilocks. So, you know, when reading Goldilocks, they don't want, you don't want your porridge too hot, you don't want it too cold, you want it right in the middle. And that's where lake trout are. They, they don't like the warm uh, waters at the surface. But at the bottom of lakes, often the oxygen levels get too low because there are bacteria down there that are exuding oxygen. Even in our healthy lakes, uh, lakes that haven't been impacted by all the and curves. And so they survive in this, this golden box, so right in the middle, where the temperature is just right and the oxygen levels are just right. Uh, and they're very long-lived fish, and, and they're very sensitive to, uh, to, to a number of factors. And so to get right at your question, not only the positioning chips, but they, they do inject uh, tags in them that can monitor their depth and their location through telemetry. All right? And so they can find out where they are horizontally in the lake and also what depth they're staying in. And so this is uh, an example of a fish that was tagged, or actually this is a whole number of fish that are tagged in the line is the average, and these other lines are the standard deviation. Um, and what you can see, this is the start of May, and as you go through the year, out through the summer. And as the, as the, as the spring comes and the ice comes off, the, the surface water temperatures start to warm up, and the thermocline starts to deepen, and that's when you see the red zone getting deeper and deeper. And at the same time, the low oxygen conditions start to build up in these bottom waters. And so these lake trout are squeezed into a smaller and smaller area. So now you can imagine if the uh, if the summer is getting longer and longer and longer, what's going to happen is they're going to squeeze to the point where there's no optimal habitat for these lake trout to exist. And it doesn't mean that they're simply going to die at that point. Uh, what it means is they're going to have to make a choice. Uh, do, they, do they try to live in, in conditions that are a little too oxygen, a little oxygen for them, or do they live where it's a little too warm for them? And it's likely they're going to live up where it's a little too warm for them, but it's going to affect their growth rates. And those growth rates are going to slow and slow and slow. And a very similar prediction uh, was for warm water fish. And what this is, is uh, the largest size classes of, of lake trout from, from three of our lakes. Two of them, and these are lakes that were not, uh, didn't have experiments on them. Uh, and essentially what's happening is these large trophy fish are starting to disappear. They're getting smaller and they're getting skinny. Again, this is confirming uh, the hypotheses of fisheries researchers everywhere that's saying that essentially what climate change is going to do is going to reduce the growth rates. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, and I think most people consider climate change is about air temperature. That's, again, only half of the story. And a big part of the story for lakes everywhere is how precipitation is going to change. And we're not the first people to say this. There's others who, who, who have said the exact same thing. Um, and the uh, International Panel on Climate Change has produced report after report that talks about how future temperatures are going to change, but they're also trying to estimate how future precipitation patterns are going to change. Uh, this is a lot more uncertain than it is for temperature. Temperature, they have fairly good confidence in. 
precipitation is not so is not great. But what the models tend to say is that for regions like this, we're going to have wetter springs and drier summers. Uh, and we've well, what I'll show maybe in this one, and I'll get to it in a minute. But why that's really important. And as Mike said, it's not just important about what happens in the lake, but what happens in the watershed. Because rainfall uh, is what connects the watershed to the lakes. Water falls on the, on the watersheds, and then it, it moves through the soils into the streams, and it carries a number of things with it from that, from the soils into the streams, and eventually into the lakes. And uh, I'm going to use the Lake Winnipeg example too, uh, as Mike did, uh, just to illustrate how important these precipitation changes are. Lake Winnipeg has a really large watershed. It stretches all the way from the Rocky Mountains almost to Lake Superior. We're in the Lake Winnipeg watershed here. All of the water from Lake of the Woods goes north through the Winnipeg River and eventually makes it to Lake Winnipeg. Um, but climate change, uh, the changes in rainfall, so we've, in the, in the, in around the Red River Valley and around Winnipeg, there's been increased rainfall since about 1990. And what that's been associated with is a large amount of nutrients being washed off the farm fields into the Red River and moving into Lake Winnipeg, causing a dramatic increase in algorithms on that lake. And to put it in perspective, the city of Winnipeg, if you might have read the newspaper recently, is considering upgrading its, it's already upgraded two of its treatment plants. It's upgraded the north end treatment plant now, which is the largest one. And this figure is out of date. It's now estimated to cost about $1.8 billion is the latest estimate. Uh, and the reason it's cost so much is because they're considering removing nitrogen as well as phosphorus. And our data at PLA suggests we don't really need to focus on nitrogen. What we really need to focus on is phosphorus. And, and the cost savings from that alone, we're talking about hundreds of millions instead of billions of dollars in, in uh, savings instead of uh, upgrading that treatment. So the consequences of these decisions are a real bad. Uh, as well. It's not just uh, uh, environmental. Uh, yes? So, Dr. Eugene, uh, the farmers uh, are using nitrogen to, uh, for, as fertilizer, and it comes from Saskatchewan mostly, since they have vast reserves of, uh, of the uh, fertilizer the farmers. Uh, so, uh, it's going to be a problem uh, you know, sorting out what the farmers are going to be allowed to use, nitrogen, if they don't. Uh, it'll be okay for the water, it'll be an improvement. So there'll be lots of problems that uh, are going to be tied up with those two ends. Yeah, so there's been a number of researchers, and uh, as Mike said, some of our former scientists have been very active in the English uh, water and understanding the mercury issues there. There's been a number of our uh, former scientists who've been working on this problem as well. And they have, they have made a very strong case that the nutrient loads to Lake Winnipeg are directly related to flow. And uh, uh, to, to put this in, in perspective, and not to demonize the farmers actually, is their phosphorus loss rates from farm fields are less than 1% of Lake Winnipeg. So it's a very small amount of phosphorus that gets into the lakes. But that phosphorus has a huge impact on the lakes. And, and because we've had so much increase in uh, precipitation and flow, since 1990, it's the argument is that what we really need to focus on is control of flow. It's we can try to update best management practices for farms, but when we're really dealing with that one percent. It's hard to you know, really costly to reduce that one percent to half a percent. But if we could, if we could uh, uh, it, try to re reduce the number of wetlands that are that are uh, removed and actually increase water storage on the landscape. We could make a dramatic reduction, not only how much phosphorus gets in the lake, but reducing flood risk as well. And so there's a number of really important reasons to want to hold water back on the landscape. I'll probably add one thing too. The, the increases of precipitation in the Lake Winnipeg watershed are greatest in the Red River, which is the main source of phosphorus. It's not Saskatchewan, it, it, it's the Red River. So around this region, the same question, how has uh, rainfall or precipitation changed here? And, and I think really, uh, this is actually uh, data from the Kenora uh, Urban Canada Weather Station. These gray dots that are there, and the, the triangles on top there are our meteorological station. And you see there's a lot of variation from year to year. 
And what the solid line is, is the seven year running average. And you see, since about 1990, we've seen an increase in precipitation, and it's basically stayed there. Uh, the trend is completely driven by changes in rainfall during the spring and summer, uh, not so much snow. In fact, on this bottom graph here, where the squares are, are snowfall over that same period, the snowfall has not significantly changed. Maybe a slight decline, but we can't actually statistically say it's any different than it was in 1970. So we are seeing uh, in the last uh, you know, 20, uh, almost 30 years now, elevated rainfall and it stayed very, very high. So we're getting a lot of rain in this, in this area. And unlike in the, in the Red River Basin and, and, the, and the issue around the Winnipeg, where it's phosphorus being mobilized from the fields, and, and creating algorithms, the issue in these boreal regions is uh, what they call dissolved organic carbon. And so what that is, if you see that bottle in the middle there, whenever you look at a lake or a pond and you see that it's that stained tea color, that's dissolved organic carbon. And what it is, it's, it's, the, it's the, the soils and the peat lands, it's the humic substances in there that have been washed, the precipitation washes those substances out into the lake, and it makes the lakes that stained color. Uh, and what these graphs are showing, and I apologize for how small the words are, but on the bottom is uh, the annual precipitation, and on, the, on, on this axis is the amount of organic carbon that's being uh, fed into one of our reference lakes from three, three different streams. And, and I just make the point that they are directly related to how much we fall again, how much organic carbon will be. And that's really important. And, and you can go to lakes, there are lakes. Out, uh, in, in this area that are so clear they look like you're in the Caribbean. Uh, and there are lakes here that are so dark that you can't stick your, your hand out more than a few centimeters and still see it. So, so our lakes here span that whole range of dissolved organic carbon and it has really large implications for how much light reaches down to different depths. And what this line is here is what we call the photic depth or the depth to which plants can grow. And there are some lakes where plants can grow down to 20 meters or so. But as that amount of organic carbon increases, uh, plant growth can only occur in the top 50 meters, or top 5 meters, sorry. So you're losing a lot uh, of your lake that can, that, that predict, that, 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 and when these plants grow, this is the base of the grass. So if you have less algae and algal growth, you also have less uh, growth of bugs, which is what Mike works on, and less growth of fish. And so there's a real concern because lakes around the world, uh, especially in eastern North America and Europe, they're, they're called brownification lakes, are getting brown. And it's from two consequences. One is recovery from acid rain, and that's really important in eastern Canada and in western Europe. But the other one is climate change, and there's a lot of parts of the world that are getting wetter. And that getting wetter is associated with lakes getting browner. Uh, and uh, just, yeah, so it affects a number of things. It also affects the depth of the thermocline because light doesn't penetrate down as deep. Of course, light is energy. It's used to heat the lakes. So if, it does, if, if, it, if it's absorbed at shallower depths, it releases that energy and heat and forms it up at shallower depths. So the thermocline is shallower. Uh, and lastly, what I wanted to say was uh, the future is not simply an extension of the past. And I, and I talked earlier about that, that what we're doing is trying to understand more about the future by examining the past. So it is very helpful and very useful. But I wanted to give an example of this region where summer air temperatures, like I said, have not increased over the past 50 years here. But uh, global climate models, and particularly those round circles up there, that's uh, what they call the relative concentration pathway in the fall. That's the trajectory that we're on now if we don't do anything about climate change. And so that's what air temperatures, summer air temperatures, are projected to look like in this region in uh, 2070 or 2025, uh, 2050 and 2070. So, it, and it is quite a bit warmer than what we've ever experienced in this region, or at least over the last few years. Uh, and what that means is uh, for us as scientists is that we can't simply just look at the past. Is that we need to couple uh, what we've learned from the past with using a modeling approach to treat and holding system experiments to, to try to get at what this future is going to look like. And it is, uh, we're, we're getting there, we're not all the way there, but uh, we have a little ways to go. And with that, I say thank you, and both Mike and I are happy to entertain any questions.
I'm sorry, I have to ask another question. In the United Nations, they work on the basis of five to ten years. And uh, here we're looking at uh, a span of up to 50 years, or 30 years from now, roughly. Uh, so why is it there's a dichotomy, if I can call that? Why, why are they worried and say that it's happening now? We have massive global changes in Australia, etc., Europe, all over the place. Uh, so, but in my mind, I think I wonder what the reason is. Five to ten years, it's really happening, they said. The uh, environmental scientists, when they met in, um, I think it was Paris or Geneva, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and now we're, we're saying, well, in 50 years, you know, I'm not criticizing that. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying that there's a dichotomy. And how would you explain it? Well, I guess the first part is that you know climate change isn't just something of the future. As I showed, we've been climate change has been occurring since the eighteen fifties, uh, and it's been it's been rapid since the eighteen fifties, and we're experiencing it right now. The challenge, uh, I mean, the IPCC reports come out to project out at different time periods into the future. Often it's twenty five or fifty years, uh, sometimes hundred years. Um, the challenge in working in the short term is, is, is there's a lot of variability from year to year. And, I mean, we're, this is sort of the joke, so we're talking about climate change when it's really cold outside. This is not the right time to talk about it. Uh, but you can have, you're, we're still going to have really cold winters. We're still going to have cold summers. We're going to have summers that are dry. We're going to have summers that are wet. Uh, and so, in, in the short term, uh, what, the, what the climate projections often do is they take the average of 10 year spans in the past compared to averages of 10 year spans in the future, and they remove that climate variability. And that can be a real challenge because when someone says, well, in five years from now, you know, it's going to be a lot, it's going to be this much warmer, it's going to be this much wetter, and that five years comes and it's not because, because of that variability. It could be that you experienced a couple years of really cold weather. But, but as you saw in the graphs, it is this constant march forward, forward, forward. And, and every year we kept, or every few years we set a new record for the warmest air temperature ever in our 50 years, or the wettest year on record, the earliest ice out. Every year we seem to be, or every few years we seem to be setting a new record. So I, I hope that answers your question. I mean, yeah. it's that variability is yeah. that issue. Uh, I'm worried about what's happening in uh, Greece, for example. They're going into the Mediterranean uh, Sea, pulling out all the uh, plastic garbage. Uh, the guy over uh, to the north uh, of uh, Hawaii, the same thing, and it's covering hundreds of square miles. And uh, so we've got so many other things that are going to be affecting our climate. Uh, because <coughs> this is just a thing that's progressively getting worse and worse. And uh, how, how quickly it might, it might... For example, they found an, uh, a mammoth in... Uh, uh, Alaska a few years ago, and uh, you know what? He had green uh, grass in, in his uh, in his gut. So it must have happened very quickly. And we have, uh, if we don't do anything uh, now, what's going to happen? Uh, it, we might have a, a surprise and a quick uh, uh, a death for everybody. Well, I think what you did on something that Mike talked about at the start of the presentation is that climate change is this slow moving thing, and there's a lot of variability associated with it. But it's overlapped on these other stressors. They're happening about land use, and you know, there could be plastics, and there could be contaminants, and there could be a lot of other things. And so, not one thing is influencing lakes or lake of the woods. As I said, there's invasive species here. There's there's nutrient loading. There's they're regulating the hydrology of the system. And so, it, when you're thinking about 25, 50 years in the future, is, is we need to use an approach that can couple all of these different stressors to try to understand. And that's really, it's really challenging to do. But that's where we need to go. I'll throw in one other thing that are, are one of the holy experiments that we're looking at now is a microplastics experiment. Microplastic. Microplastic. Yeah. Uh, in, in the bellies of fish, and they don't feel hungry, <coughs> so they suck up, and uh, so that's a serious problem. Too. So, Scott, um, two things. First of all, if the carbon being absorbed uh, insulates off the land is making them darker and, and then cooler, would that help the light trip? Uh, in some ways, you you you, you hit a right on point to conservation. Uh, so so some parts of the country are lakes are, because precipitation is going down, lakes are getting clearer, and there the thermal climate is going down and, and reducing lake trout habitat. But this is exactly what's happening here: is that as the lakes get darker, the thermal climate actually gets shallower, and so there's more lake trout habitat. But at the so that's good. 
but at the same time, of course, the summer is also getting longer, and so they have to spend more time. They have more habitat, but they have to spend more time in that summer starvation. Again, we just did a whole ecosystem experiment in LA where we did the reverse of that, where we reduced inflows uh, to the system uh, and, and decreased the dissolved organic carbon, which increased the thickness of that upper layer. And we had tags that we were talking about earlier, just hyperacoustic tags of trout, and we see changes in their behavior uh, that was related to changes in the thickness of this upper water. Uh, again, these are all the sorts of things that we're trying to do to better understand. And the other question is, um, we know that the oceans are absorbing carbon. They become carbon sinks. That they become the oceans are becoming more acidic. The, you know, coral reefs are being destroyed, and fish habitat is being changed. What can you say about freshwater lakes and absorption of carbon and acidity? What can you say about that? So the boreal zone as a whole. It's the like Mike like pointed out, it's the largest ecosystem on the planet and it plays a globally important role in the carbon cycle. Uh, that carbon is in the forest, the forest soils, it's also in wetlands and peatlands, and then it's in the lakes, and particularly in the bottom sediments of lakes. So, what's happening with more rainfall, we have more organic carbon coming off the landscape, going into the lakes, it's fueling bacterial production, and again, it's more carbon dioxide is being emitted from lakes in this region. And so, it's this greenhouse gases now going back up to the atmosphere. But at the same time, some of that carbon is also sinking down to the bottom of the lakes and making those sediments. So lakes, in terms of the total carbon, lakes are actually a carbon sink. They accumulate carbon over time, and that's why the sediments build up over time. But lakes are also sources of CO2 to the atmosphere, because some of this carbon comes off the landscape going to the atmosphere. So it's sort of weird to wrap your head around them, but they're both at the same time. Um, so, yeah. and I like to think the other part of that is, is that the forests that are in this area have about a 50 to 60 year fire cycle, and so all of that carbon gets back into the atmosphere. Uh, the, the carbon that's stored in the, the wetlands, the peatlands, and the lakes tend not to burn, and they stay there, so they're more permanent. They're there on geological time scales, 10,000 years or longer. So, those are the long term carbon sinks. So my question is actually just a direct follow-up on that. I was wondering if you're doing any work looking at uh, land use changes recent, uh, related to forest fires in particular. So particularly on the RCP 8.5 pathway, we'll probably get a lot more forest fires. That's that, that's the prairie climate projection anyhow for this area that we see more forest fire activity. So are you working on doing any Modeling on that? Uh, no, you know, my, my one thought on this is I mean, the, part of the reason <clears throat> this area, the, the soils are very thin. Okay? And basically, it's rocks and water okay? and humans. And the reason why is because this area burns for people. Okay? And, and, and so that carbon is regularly returned to the atmosphere. The, the main, as Scott just said, the main places where carbon is stored permanently. Is in wetlands and lake sediments. So yeah, we, we, the frequency with which fires burn off that carbon may well increase, and it may have some impacts for water quality. Although interestingly, there was a fire in 1980 uh, on one of our reference lakes at ELA. Uh, there wasn't, near, despite the fact that it burned all of the, the watershed and the soils around the lake, it did not have a huge impact on water quality in the lake. It had a detectable impact, not nearly as large as you might have guessed from uh, the devastation that was visually up here. So uh, it's hard to know. It is certainly something of concern. I, and of course, it's of concern to anybody living in the forest and things like that. But in terms of water quality, it's hard to know. The other thing that Scott, you know, when you were asking about the, this dissolving organic carbon, of a lot of some of it just passes right through the lakes and on out to the ocean. So what happens to that carbon once it hits the ocean? And, and uh, if you're, you're talking about a watershed that on a global scale, that's also an important question for you. Stuff. And my other question was, um, 
how far away do you have to be to be able to be able to ground up on the beads on your lawn or you know, save a lot of water? And another thing I was wondering about is that when we travel to a country, I think it was resort, one of the guys told us that the lakes <coughs> were on the algae that they were blowing oxygen into the water to, to provide oxygen. Have good that. Um, I, I think we can maybe address the first part of the last part, but I'm not sure the rapid question. So your, your first question was around uh, oh, uh, too much out, too much possibility. Right. So I you know I'll, I'll start with like Winnipeg and then I'll move to Lake Woods a little bit. In, in Lake in Lake Winnipeg, the whole city of Winnipeg only contributes about six percent of the nutrient loads to the whole land, and so the issue there is really dealing with it at, at the landscape level, at the agricultural level. If you don't deal with the, with with agricultural loading, you're never going to improve the water quality of the land. And I presume I haven't seen the data for Lake Woods, but I presume it's very similar to that. That a large part of the problem is actually is historical phosphorus that's coming through the Rainy River. And I know that phosphorus loading has declined dramatically in the past decades, but now we're sort of living with legacy phosphorus that's living in sediments. And that gets to part three of your question about blowing oxygen into lakes. And this is a bit more about chemistry than probably anybody wants to know in here, but the, uh, it, it, this is really important for algal blooms, is that phosphorus binds with Okay, and so what happens is they bind, and they, they, they precipitate out, and they sink to the bottom of the lakes. Uh, and so phosphorus is removed through this process, natural process. But when it goes anoxic at the bottom of the lakes, uh, that, that they unbind, and phosphorus is released back out into the water. And so that, uh, that one element, that one speck of phosphorus that you put into the lake, then just cycles around for years and years and years, creating problems. And so the idea is that if you oxygenate the bottom of lakes, it stops that unbinding of iron and phosphorus, and that phosphorus and iron stay in the sediments. And so that's the purpose of why they oxygenate the lakes. In practice, it's very challenging to do. If you imagine a lake like Lake of the Woods trying to oxygenate the bottom of this lake, it would be logistically impossible. Or actually, not impossible, but extremely possible. <laughs> So it's very challenging. Can I add two things? One about the carburetor. Uh, yeah, I think Scott's right that the, the contribution, but Todd, you can correct me for like the woods, but it's like one percent or something of the phosphorus is in the shoreline. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's less than two percent over a whole scheme of the yeah. size of the lake. It's a small amount, but yeah, my understanding is carburetors are not as good as composting. Like, like compost, <laughs> if you are adding nutrients to the water that will ultimately get into the lake. But Scott's right, the contribution is tiny. Uh, and on this aeration question, the Mothman people have aerated lakes not only for the reasons that Scott said, which are totally correct, but also because he, if he's, uh, in the deeper waters of these lakes, you can get buildup of things like hydrogen sulfate, that egg smell, rotten egg smell that you can get from water, and it, can, uh, it can make the waters uninhabitable for fish. So people will often mix and aerate lakes to promote fish habitat and to reduce uh, those, it's also swamp gases and other for hydrogen sulfur. Uh, so you know you want to you know, also eliminate those problems, and that's done with the aeration. But aeration is limited to small water bodies. It, uh, it needs energy and costs money. So, yeah, I, I would say something about uh, that. There is some local sources that cause eutrophication, especially your algal blooms in the embayments, especially, and that's the use of lawn fertilizers, especially in you know, a lot of people landscape lawns all the way down from their homes uh, down to the lake farm. And that can, like I said, a very small amount of water that reaches off that lawn that's fertilized gets into those abatements. And then the other part is the physical structures in the abatements that restrict water level uh, can allow those nutrients not to get flushed back up to the main part of the lake, but stay in these small abatements. And so there's, you can see major increases in plant and algae growth in these embayments and, and so a real solution is real local at that point is to, is, is to stop using especially uh, fertilizers and phosphorus. Yeah, if I could just add to that, uh, when we did say that the on the grand scheme of the whole lake of the woods that uh, phosphorus coming from 
shoreline sources from residents and so on is, is very, very minor. But to follow up on your point, in some of the isolated embayments, the proportion of the phosphorus, if, for example, septics are leaking, uh, is much more important. And in some of those isolated embayments, again, assuming the worst case scenario where everything's leaking, will be upwards of 33, 35% of, of the load. So that tells you that we need to manage these things on a sub basin level. There are isolated areas where land use practices have to be uh, applied or addressed for that local area of management. It's not just fine to say, well, it's less than 2% of the whole lake, so give up. It can be quite significant in the isolated invasions. And if I could just add one more thing to the oxygen injection and phosphorus binding the iron bit, there's potentially a climate issue here that's Creating, could create a mutually reinforcing cycle with, uh, uh, if you have uh, longer, warmer uh, seasons of, of open water with strong thermoclines, that you could have a longer and enhanced period for oxygen depletion of the body, reinforcing that phosphorus regeneration from the body. And we've seen, uh, there's some work from uh, Dr. Mark Edlin, St. Croix, Watershed uh, Research Station in Minnesota, looking at the southern basin of Lake of the Woods, uh, the, the shallow big traverse bay, uh, looking at uh, both the temperature profiles and the oxygen profiles. And they've shown over the last couple of years that that south basin of the Lake of the Woods that we always thought was mixed and stirred up by the wind uh, does have uh, short periods of thermal stratification where you get that oxygen depletion and potentially that pulse of phosphorus coming out. And if that condition were to increase through uh, a climate warming cycle, then you could see accelerated re-release of this phosph legacy phosphorus in the sediments. Yeah, I think the way we like to put that is what climate change is doing is making our lakes more sensitive to land use practices, and that we have to be even better at producing nutrient loads to lakes than we have in the past in order just to maintain what we're at now. That's a really important. Carbon, carbon dioxide is being used by the cement people around the world now. So uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, you mentioned there was uh, making headlines all over. Can you add something to that or, 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 or shall we just leave it there? Because uh, they're using a, a tremendous amount of uh, carbon dioxide uh, in making cement. And now I don't, hold, I don't have the, uh, the facts, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing because every town, every village, every City, etc., on the highways where to use to use cement, etc., is uh, is going to be able to get so much of that carbon dioxide and get it into the cement. You're correct. Right? So you're correct. There's a lot, a lot of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know. So you're quantifying rain or water events by both the number of events per year or the intensity or the volume of water. Like, is there a different like has a precipitation or and how would that affect the carbon? Right, so we're doing, we, we, it's a good question, but we sort of looked at it in all of the ways, because we're trying to, there, there is, I mean, rainfall comes in in, in events, right? It's you know, not constant. Uh, but we look at it through just total amount of rainfall in a, in a year or in a over a period of time. Um, we've tried to look at changes in intensity. We haven't, I haven't found any yet. It's possible that maybe I just need to have a better way to look at it. But uh, there's a professor that we're working with now, uh, Dr. Norman Cassidy from the University of Winnipeg, who's looking at how storm intensity affects the amount of carbon that's mobilized from the soils. So we don't have the full answer yet, but that's something that we're, we're hoping to start doing in the next couple of years. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, sort of relate to that with increased precipitation uh, generally for drier summers. Could water levels fluctuate? Uh, could there be an increase in water level fluctuation, or would that not be very significant? Uh, yeah, so you know, one of the kind of neat things about you know, having 50 years of data is, is, uh, is having that sort of water level fluctuation over all that time. Now, when we've modeled it out under a variety of different precipitation scenarios, it seems the lakes always 
bounce back in the spring. But then during the summer period, they can get lower and lower and to the point where they become disconnected from the, from the lake, so the streams will stop flowing. And so this past summer was a good example of that, where there was a lot of rain in the spring, and it was a very dry summer until sometime in September, and then it rained like steam. Uh, and so that's what happened, is the water level in, in some of our main reference lakes lowered uh, uh, probably by about 30 centimeters or so, and reduced, uh, there was no outflow from the lake for a period of several months. And so in some systems, that can be really important if, it's, if it is connections for, for fish habitat, for example. Uh, these lakes become disconnected, they sort of become on the islands. Um, but the, the scenarios that I've seen always suggest that the lakes will come bounce back in the spring of every year. So they'll fill up, and then they'll start to sink. So the question is, how far will they turn in the summer? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, but uh, the first one is just wondering if you, um, like as a nonprofit, um, you actively partner with the indigenous communities here uh, in the Treaty Three area and like the Winnipeg, like Winnipeg watershed area. Because I know, like, we're um, we're helping out with a um, climate change adapt. Uh, research community research project with the Project Advisory, and the thing that community members are are talking about in a number of the in the three reserves that we're doing our pilot project is algae blooms. That's something that comes up, and that like the increase of algae blooms plus their aiding infrastructure is, is creating a real impact on their water quality. So I was just wondering, like as like as a charitable and a small profit organization, if you're doing any work with those communities and, and or the Ministry of Environment. We're we're, uh, we're trying very hard. Uh, we're trying to reach out to uh, local First Nations communities, uh, uh, and uh, if you can help us with that, we would really love it. And do you mind if I just ask one like other quick one? I'm just wondering if you have any examples of like local adaptation and mitigation um, that's happening like kind of in our area. Like I'm thinking in particular of like green infrastructure because I think that's really cool how we can like use like swamp land and stuff like that to help. With water quality, we all the time, like with um, <coughs> dealing with money and the economy and um, like about logging and all those industries, that's like the first thing to go is, is the swamp plants. So, that's what I think. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, that's, it's one that we're getting to more now since we've been uh, with ISD and the nonprofit. A bit of our history when we were with the government, I think a lot of the focus was on impact of a particular uh, land use activity, not so much on remediation or, or recovery, but we're starting to get into that now. And some of it, we're, and one of the things about being at this nonprofit is, is so we have, we're like a, one of the science branches, and they have a sort of policy branch, and they work all around the world. And they're, they're dealing more with questions like this, how do we rehabilitate lakes? Uh, and so we get pulled into questions like that all the time. There are some potentially natural approaches that you can, you can do. Um, like I said, in the, in the Lake Winnipeg Basin example, holding water back on the landscape is a very good one because that reduces flood risk, but it also reduces your risk of, of algorithms. The other one is, there, I mean, it's a, it's a really big question, uh, and it's hard to break it down into specific points. Another example is, uh, uh, Phosphorus, which is the main contributor to algorithms, binds to particles really well. So it does not a lot, it, it does leach from soils, but it also binds to soils and to vegetation. So if there's a way to recirculate water through wetlands, as an example, it will it'll bind phosphorus more onto those, uh, onto those wetland plants and it reduces the amount of phosphorus that's going to into the lake. And there's a colleague of ours at, at IISD that's working on that. It's, it's what they call the bioeconomy project about uh, essentially harvesting, using macrophytes to harvest nutrients on lakes, then harvesting those macrophytes and turning those macrophytes into biofuel pellets, and then using those biofuel pellets to, to you know, in, in, in place of burning coal in some of these small hydrate and intimate communities, which used to burn coal only five, ten years ago. And, and so it has a number of the idea is in this has a number of positive spin-offs, and I think that's maybe what you're trying to get. So there's a couple examples, and yeah, I think there's probably a lot, I'm sort of on the spot here, I can't, and I'm 
It isn't traditionally what we do, but we're now that we're paired with IISD, we're trying to think about these kinds of things. But uh, yeah, we, we're working. On it. <laughs> I've got a quick question. With the dearth of uh, phone numbers, are you in a local phone book? So if we want to find you, we can actually find you. Uh, I don't know if we're in the phone book. I haven't looked in a phone book for a long time. <laughs> but we do have a local number, yes. Even though know, it, it's not always the easiest to get through. Do you, do you, do you share it with anybody? Yeah, I, I'm sure, but I think it's on our website. Well, right. I, 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 and I will, email is the best way to contact us, partly because oh, we have yeah. us old folks. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, the problem we have, we, we have an old uh, tower with a voice over internet protocol phone that doesn't work very well. <laughs> and uh, we've tried to look into what it would cost to get good internet and good phones out, out of the LA. And, uh, if you're a really responsible new bankruptcy Like I say, older people like to talk on the telephone. Well, please, try no, it's not my choice. <laughs> but anyway, try following us over and we'll try to get back to you. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good segue in that uh, Mike and I have brought a number of uh, materials that has our phone number on. Uh, Help so, us pay for a phone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the other thing is quality of life is, is coming up. Uh, and every year we have tours. And, and uh, uh, basically, we have tours. Basically, we have a uh, outreach coordinator now who will. Because of any number of people. Uh, but, and then every other year we alternate between Menorah and Dryden and bring out um, whole groups of people come. Uh, it's a busload out there. This year is Menorah's year. Next year it's Dryden and it goes back and forth. So if you're interested in visiting, come on out and see it. <clears throat> How about if I invited you to join me for lunch on the telephone? What would you do? <laughs> they wouldn't get the message. <laughs> yeah, our best. Our best. Did you join? Thought. Yeah, just a quick question then. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the precipitation record and the DOC relationship. And my question really revolves around cycles and time scales versus trajectory. Uh, I think when we looked at the climate between the Lake and Woods Basin, and I think Brian did the same a few years back, identified sort of a 30 year period of well dry cycles. Do you have. Uh, the data the ability to A say is that not the case anymore, or B to tease apart what appears to be a wet period now trajectory <coughs> versus part of the 30 years. I, this is always the challenge, and we talked about the length of our record, which is one of the longest records out there, but it's actually really short compared to uh, climate change writ large. And, and the, the longer record here, and I'm sure Scott can speak to this too, is the Kenora record and it, and it does look more cyclic. So there is always the risk when you're looking at a section, you know, if you look at one piece it looks flat, another piece it looks like it's changing, that, that you're not capturing the whole range. And, and the only thing I can say is that we need you keep doing this so that the record gets longer and we get a better sense of what's going on. Uh, well, maybe I, so what Todd is pointing out is this this is rainfall every year and it seems to go through this 31 year cycle. But it appears that that cycle has been disrupted, right? If that cycle were still occurring, we should actually be in a drought period right now. And so this is what this line is: is when you, which takes out that cycle, is that we've got wetter and we've stayed wet. And what to me this suggests is that there's these large uh, air masses that are moving over, and it used to oscillate back and forth like some sort of long cycle uh, that's now staying over our region. And as anyone's guess now, because we should be in a drought right now, and we're not. We should have been in a drought period for the last five to eight years, and we're not. So, uh, where the future goes, I don't know. Like that's that's really good I have one thing. Before we all go, whenever that time to be, if you could come up with some uh, ideas, what we could do as a community. You know, that will help the process, I'm sure. And then it will go on to, to the spread <coughs> relatives, friends, etc., in different parts of the world. This is what we're doing in Canada. This is what we're doing in the, in the Canary area. And, you know, it would take 10 things that children can learn. 
And uh, your children are, are terrific, you know. You give them a project and they're going to work hard to come up with some, some discovery. And they'll discuss this and they'll pass it on, etc. So we cannot forget that uh, we're all contributing and there's a fantastic opportunity to be sure that this is going to continue. Well, I you know something that is, I think, near and dear to both Mike and I is that since we drew from the federal government to the nonprofit, uh, we've now taken on a much stronger role in science education and outreach than we ever have in the past. And well, that's fantastic. There is a great team of uh, people at IISD, our parent organization, who work on science communication. And so our, we never even had a website before that was. Now our website has excellent outreach uh, and communication materials. There's great videos on there that explain different uh, things that we've talked about today in a very uh, compelling and, and engaging way for all different age groups. Uh, they're working on um, our outreach coordinator. If, if, if anyone is interested in getting uh, one of our people to come to your student's classes here, we'll do that. Uh, and. I think for like specifically for Lake of the Woods, I think a couple of the questions are about like Todd mentioned about algal blooms or things you can do in your local area about reducing nutrient loads and encouraging that, and about invasive species. I think is another big one here is about really making sure that you're not introducing any new species to the uh, to the lakes because one of there's a couple of avenues these tend to come from. One sometimes it's bait fish, so making sure that the fish are alive is a very good one because if they get out. To the or making sure they're locally sourced. Uh, and the other one is the aquarium trade. It's often when you buy species that come from really far away and think that they're not going to survive this environment. Your, your child is now doesn't want to have this fish anymore and you decide to put it in the stream. That's not a good idea because some of these fish do survive. And sometimes they cause real havoc in the environment. So really important to do things like that. They're spying water flea in the lakes, clean your boats and nets before moving them between lakes. Um, yeah. In England, they use the rainwater instead of tap water to uh, do the gardens and flowers, etc. And then they switch it flowers that are going in their vegetables uh, right beside the houses. It's a fantastic movement. So, thanks, Bob. So, I'm going to close, uh, and Mike and Scott will be staying around. And if you have other questions, you can approach them personally. So, I'd like to present these small tokens of our appreciation for coming out and uh, we hope you'll come again and I'm sure that people will uh, will be able to suggest topics if you come back next year. Yeah.